Good morning and welcome to This Week. Healthcare havoc. We have my Republican colleagues trying to scare everybody. Will the gentleman okay. yield? No, I will not yield to this monkey court. Obamacare's rollout botched. The new law under fire. Is the president's signature achievement in serious trouble? This morning, the debate from all sides, plus our own expert, Dr. Richard Besser. Then, former Vice President Dick Cheney out of office, still making headlines. On new revelations of secret spying, the Republican Civil War, and his daughter's run for Senate. Cheney takes it all on live, only on This Week. Plus, the perils of social media, power players embarrassed. It's all right here this Sunday morning. From ABC News, This Week with George Stephanopoulos starts now. Hello again. A whole lot to get to this morning, starting with that awful launch for Obamacare. You've heard about all those problems with the website. Now the White House is promising a fix just after Thanksgiving. But is that realistic? What do these early troubles say about the program's long-term prospects? And what does that mean for you and your health care? Two key senators standing by way in on all that. But first, a reality check from our own doctor in residence, Rich Besser. And Rich, let's start with the basics. Everybody trying to get on this website, get the insurance, are running into three separate hurdles. That's right. I mean, the, the website is definitely not ready for prime time. There are three problems. The first is problem accessing that site and creating your accounts. Then the, some people are getting incorrect quotes and eligibility information. And then that information that's being passed to, to insurance companies isn't always correct. This, these are all big problems. And there are always, you know, problems with technological startups, with, with network startups. But what does this say about the long-term prospects for the program? Well, you you know, if they get it fixed in six months, I don't think anyone's going to be talking about this. But, but there's some key factors here. For this to be successful, they have to ensure that young, healthy Americans sign on. There are only 15 percent of Americans that, that this website matters for. Eighty five percent of us have insurance in other ways. But healthy young Americans, we need to get them involved because they don't use the health care system as much. And they're going to provide that that financial support for everyone else who's using it so that as they get older, they'll 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 have care as well. So if they don't think the website works. They don't sign on. Insurance premiums go up for everybody. Then next year comes around, even if the problems are fixed, the prices are higher. So they might not sign up again. That's right. You know, if you don't have them on board, the, the financial structure really doesn't work very well. But I think the long term, uh, you know, impact of, of Obamacare, of Affordable Care Act, is, is going to be very good because there's so many other things that are included. Coverage of people who have existing medical conditions, coverage of children up to age 26, free preventive care. And these things are things people, once they get them, they're going to want them. They're not going to want them to go away. We still have this immediate problem of the website. The White House now promising uh, to get it fixed by the end of November. Is that realistic? I think it is. Well, the end of November is, is, is questionable. If they don't hit the end of November, they're going to have problems with people whose insurance expires at the end of December, and they may have to push some of those deadlines. They brought in a new executive to oversee this. I think that's a good sign. They have one contractor who's responsible for this. And you have you, the states that have embraced this, California, Kentucky, they're the ones where we're seeing these exchanges are working. So I think that the model is sound. They just have to get it fixed. Hey, Rich Besser, thanks very much. Let's get more on this now from the senators, Democratic Senator Joe Manchin, Republican John Barrasso. And Senator Barrasso, let me begin with you. Like Rich Besser, you're a medical doctor as well. Are you as confident these problems with the website can be fixed? Uh, I'm not, George. I'll tell you, as a doctor, I want to make sure that patients can actually get affordable, high-quality uh, care. The website was supposed to be the easy part of this. Uh, so I see actually this is just the tip of the iceberg of problems with bigger problems uh, to come. But the Democrats, I think, are at a point of high anxiety. Americans have been very skeptical about this health care law. But now, George, there's a lot of anger about the wasted taxpayer dollars uh, on this website about all of the waivers that the president has given to business, to unions, to members of Congress. The fact that nobody who works at the White House is going to have to sign up uh, on the exchanges. And now Americans are saying, wait a minute, why do I have to pay a fine if I don't sign up? None of these other what? people seem to have the same problems. One of the Democrats who supports the law but also is worried about the fact that the website isn't working is Senator Joe Manchin. He's with us as well, Democrat of West Virginia. Senator, you're the only Democrat who's called for a full year delay in the implementation of the, man of the, uh, of the, the penalty uh, for the individual mandate. Are you willing to hold off on that if the White House actually meets this deadline of the end of November to fix the website problems? George, I've been working in a bipartisan manner with Senator Johnny Isaacson and trying to put a coalition together of bipartisan senators. 
which basically says the penalty, the fine of $95 will not be into effect until January 2015. At that time, the fine will be $325. It'll still induce people to get involved, but it'll also give us a time to transition in. And I think we need that transition period to work out the things. And we have identified a lot of problems, There's a lot of glitches. When I was governor, we had glitches getting up our claims with Medicaid claims uh, uh, program started. We worked through it and we got a pro uh, uh, we've got a system now that's about of a model uh, of the country. So we know it can be done, but we've got to work together. There's a lot of good things that help a lot of West Virginians in the bill. If we all work towards fixing something and if we just can't fix it, then you can make a concerted effort to make the changes. But we need that transition period and I think this is so a you're good for the one year, uh, you're for the one year delay that. no matter what. So far not a lot of Democrats have signed on. But Senator Bross, I want to take that to you because you know a lot of Democrats believe that uh, you and your colleagues are actually rooting for the program to fail. What do you say to a constituent when they come to you and say we want help signing up for Obamacare? Well, uh, and folks in my office are going to help uh, any citizen with anything uh, every way that we can. Uh, I will tell you what I want is affordable care for American citizens. And in my home state of Wyoming and in Joe's home state of West Virginia, we see that the rates are actually going to be higher. The New York Times front page story the other day said exactly that, that the law has failed to provide affordable care and coverage uh, in rural America. So that is a real problem. The president made promises that this was going to be cheaper than your cell phone bill, easier to use than Amazon, and you could keep your doctor. People all across the country, George, are seeing that's just not true. Secretary Sebelius, Health and Human Services Secretary Health, Sibelius, Kathleen Sebelius is going to be facing some tough questions on Capitol Hill uh, this week. Senator Brass, you've already called on her to resign. Here was her response. The majority of people calling for me to resign, I would say, are people who I don't work for and who do not want this program to work in the first place. Senator Manchin, do you think Kathleen Sebelia should keep her job? I think Kathleen was successful as an insurance commissioner in Kansas. She was a successful governor working with both sides of the aisle. She's very capable, capable of bringing people together. I think it was unfortunate to comment the way it, was, the way it came out. Uh, but with that being said, I'm not so asking for delay. do you think she should stay in the of, job? of this law. I think she should stay and I think she will get the job done and I think she needs to bring people around her and I think she can do that. We've got to move forward. If you want to kill the program and you start making all these changes, that would kill the program. All we're asking for is don't have the fine go into place, get market driven, get market driven products, make sure you can entice and through incentives of getting young people that are healthy to join into this. We are a consumer nation. We have the great entrepreneurs. We can make this happen, but we've all got to be on the same team right now, which is Team America, to make things happen. Senator Bruss, are you willing to work with Senator Manchin on something like that? Of course, you were against the law from the start, but it is now the law of the land. Are you willing to work with him and other Democrats on trying to figure out ways to get it fixed? Well, Joe Manchin and I have co-sponsored a number of pieces of legislation about American energy. We continue uh, to work together and, and are good friends. What he is proposing is a good idea because one is it's a law. It's not just the president waving his magic wand and saying, well, this doesn't apply here. We'll give these people uh, waivers. We'll let other people out of it. So I, I encourage Senator Manchin. But again, that's just the first step. People are getting hit with sticker shock. You know, we've had more people since October 1st, George, get letters of denial where they've been law, they're losing the insurance that they have than have been people that have actually been able to sign up for the Obama health care law. And you talk about Secretary Sebelius and her comments. She's already, as of Saturday Night Live last night, the laughing stock of America. So she's lost considerable credibility. And even when she says, hey, things are going better uh, with the exchanges, I will tell you just on Friday in Washington state, 8,000 people because the state exchange wasn't coordinated with the federal database. 8,000 people were told they were going to get a higher subsidy than they're actually going to get. Now they're going to have to go back to all of those people and say, no, you're going to even pay more out of your own pocket than you thought you were going Senator to. Senator Manchin, you get the last word. Are you seeing any indication from anyone in the administration that they are willing to go along with some sort of delay? I'm not sure. I haven't spoke in detail with them, but I can tell you if we have a bipartisan group, which we've had before when they shut down to get it back open, we had seven Republicans, six Democrats and an independent. George, nobody should be forced to buy a, a policy that costs more than what they had 
and is inferior to what they had. Those things have to be worked out. The new markets that we're opening up basically is going to be good, but it has to be affordable. You have to work through this. The transition period of one year is very reasonable and doable, and the fines don't go into effect until 2015. We're still working through it. If you delay it, you're never going to have to really identify the problems and work them out. If you work through this through a transition period, I think you can. Uh, John in Wyoming and me in West Virginia, we have a lot of people that have benefited so far, but we have more people that need to have affordable health care. It shouldn't be unaffordable or be onerous to them. We've got to work this out. John is very knowledgeable. He's a good friend of mine. We can work together as Democrats and Republicans because we truly sure. are Americans first. That's what we have to. We can't go back to the old system. Gentlemen, thank you, much for, thank you very much for your time this morning. And now to the latest on the NSA spy scandal. A brand new report says the government's secret program to listen in on foreign leaders, including our allies, was even bigger than originally thought. And it comes after the German chancellor lectured President Obama this week when she found out that the U.S. has been tapping her personal cell phone. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Terry Moran has been tracking this growing controversy. Good morning, Terry. Good morning, George. Well, the hits just keep on coming from Edward Snowden's Niagara of leaks out of the NSA. And the damage to U.S. interests and the image of the country abroad just keeps growing. The latest, the German interior minister is now calling for an investigation, saying that if the U.S. tapped German cell phones on German soil, it broke German law. And, quote, those responsible must be held accountable. On the mall in Washington Saturday, protesters speaking out against NSA surveillance, including the man who sparked it all, NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden, still stuck in Russia. He asked me to deliver this message to you. We are here to remind our government officials that they are public servants, not private investigators. Snowden's cascade of shocking leaks have many close U.S. allies infuriated. Just this weekend, the revelation in a German newspaper that the U.S. Embassy in Berlin was a secret listening post spying on German government officials and business leaders. And it was just one of 80 similar NSA and CIA listening posts around the world. All this after reports that the U.S. was tapping world leaders' cell phones, including German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Merkel personally calling Obama, labeling it a grave breach of trust. I can tell you that the president assured the chancellor that the United States is not monitoring and will not monitor the communications of the chancellor. The White House didn't address whether Merkel was spied on in the past. According to a report in the British newspaper The Guardian, the NSA was listening in on 35 world leaders as early as 2006. Friday, well, Hillary Clinton, here. until yeah. recently yeah. the nation's top diplomat, weighed in. Trying to go up to the line of what is appropriate surveillance and security measures and not over the line is something we need to have a full, comprehensive discussion about. It is true, as many have said, that as long as there have been allies, there's been spying on allies. But, George, what has so deeply shocked some of America's closest partners around the world is the depth and the breathtaking extent of NSA activities in their countries. You get the sense they feel they've been digitally invaded by the NSA. And their sense of the violation of their privacy and the invasion of their citizens' privacy is profound. And George. they are pushing back hard. Okay, Terry, thanks very much.